Welcome back to The Real News Network. I'm Paul J. in Baltimore. We're continuing our series of interviews with Peter Kuznick, co-author of the movie and the book, The Untold History of the United States. And we're just going to carry on our discussion. Thanks for joining us, Peter. Good. So I'll just remind everybody again, Peter's professor of history at American University in Washington. We left off at the last segment of the interview talking about what a different type of America it was, the political culture, how different it was. Yes. Uh, there had been a kind of Cold War in the, in the 1920s after the Russian Revolution. There was quite a crackdown and uh, anti-communist hysteria and atmosphere. Uh, but by the late 30s, and then you get uh, to the, what is, I guess is the third term of Roosevelt, he appoints a man as vice president mm -hmm who has is, is left on the political spectrum as anyone that ever ran in mainstream politics. Uh, how does that happen? Henry Wallace had been Secretary of Agriculture from the beginning of the New Deal. Yeah, even, it, maybe it, we should yeah, start with that, because even that's surprising. And it, it, but he comes from such an interesting family. His father was Secretary of Agriculture under the Republican administrations of Harding and Coolidge. And his grandfather was rumored to be Secretary of Agriculture and almost was back uh, from Iowa in the 19th century. Now, he made a lot of money later, if I understand. He yes. sold his agricultural well, he did company a lot of, for... Yeah, but, but, he, he did when a lot of first plant appointed, hybridization. But is he already wealthy when he's first appointed? Uh, not very wealthy, no. No, they were, they were comfortable, certainly, from an Iowa family. They were very comfortable. But uh, I don't think very wealthy until much, much later. Because eventually his hybrid corn feeds half the world. That he, and he understood the relationship between dealing with hunger and, deal, and the possibility of world peace. That was always clear in his mind. And he was a visionary as Secretary of Agriculture, though controversial, which we could get into. But it was not, he was the leading anti-fascist in the New Deal administrations. He was very closely tied to the scientists and working with the scientists in their anti-fascist and anti-racist efforts during that time. We cannot fight to crush Nazi brutality abroad and condone race riots at home. Uh, in the early 1940s, he says America's fascists are those people who think Wall Street comes first and the American people second. Now we call those Democrats and Republicans, but in those days, uh, Wallace called them America's fascists. I mean, this would be like Obama appointing Bernie Sanders as vice president. Yeah. Something, it, it, something it, it, akin to that. Something akin to that, but Wallace had, was more, in a global sense, even more visionary than Bernie Sanders, who's great on a lot of issues. Uh, and so it's 1940, Roosevelt's going to run for a third term. He wants a real progressive on the ticket, and he turns to Henry Wallace. But the, the Democratic Party convention meeting in Chicago did not want to give him Henry Wallace. The party bosses ran the conventions in those days in ways that they can't now, and they refused to put Wallace on the ticket. Roosevelt writes an absolutely extraordinary letter to the convention, turning down the nomination. The Democratic Party has failed when it has fallen to the control of those who think in terms of dollars instead of human values. Till the Democratic Party shakes off all the shackles of control fastened upon it by the forces of conservatism, reaction, and appeasement, it will not continue its march to victory. The party cannot face in both directions at the same time. Therefore, I decline the honor of the nomination for the presidency. We already have one money-dominated conservative party in the United States. If the Democratic Party has any reason to exist, it has to be a liberal, progressive party committed to social justice. And if it's not going to be that, I'm not going to run as this candidate. Why did he want Wallace so badly? Why is he willing to wage such a fight for Wallace? The Roosevelt of this period knew we were going into a war, and he wanted an ally. And, and, and he wanted somebody who could take, uh, he, he was aware that, at, more at that point than later perhaps, of his own, that he might not live forever. And he wanted somebody who could carry on his message and his theme in terms of building a, create, a progressive world after the war. And so Wallace gets back on the ticket in 1940, but the party bosses are going to exact their revenge later. And in 1941, Henry Luce makes his fame, writes his editorial saying that the 20th century is going to be the American century. The United States is going to dominate the world economically, politically, uh, militarily. Uh, Wallace, as vice president, counters that. He gives a remarkable speech 
entitled The Century of the Common Man, says the 20th century should not be the American century, it's got to be the century of the common man. And he calls for a worldwide people's revolution. Those are his words. The march of freedom of the past 150 years has been a long drawn out people's revolution. In this great revolution of the people, there were the American Revolution of 1775, the French Revolution of 1792, the Latin American revolutions of the Bolivarian era, the German Revolution of 1848, the Russian Revolution of 1918. Each spoke for the common man in terms of blood on the battlefield. Some went to excess, but the significant thing is that the people broke their way to the light. The people are on the march toward even fuller freedom than the most fortunate peoples of the earth have hitherto enjoyed. President. It's the vice president. And he, and he says, yes, and it says we have to end colonialism, we have to end imperialism, we have to end economic exploitation, end monopolies and cartels, we need global full employment, we need to raise the standard of living, the science and technology has got to be spread around the entire globe. This is an extraordinary vision this man had. And Roosevelt's okay with the speech. Roosevelt's applauded that speech. Yeah, Roosevelt at this period wanted to see, because Roosevelt understood the, the effects of imperialism and colonialism. Roosevelt was very critical of the British and the French and the Dutch and the Portuguese, and he understood how much they had actually caused a lot of the problems in the world. Roosevelt always had his eye on what would be an American empire after the war. Now, I'm not saying American empire old colonial style. He was against old colonialism. Yes, he was against that. But it would be American empire knowing America had more money than anyone else, more manufacturing capacity than anyone else, and sort of this free market world would be America's world. Yes, he did want a free market world, and he wanted the constraints of the old kind of world with the spheres of influences uh, ended. He used his leverage over the British repeatedly to do away with the, auto, the old imperial system. But did Roosevelt believe a free market world could achieve the objectives Wallace talked about? I think Roosevelt did believe that. He believed you could have a very much more progressive kind of world if you got rid of colonialism and if the U.S. and the Soviets worked together. And his vision was for the U.S., this alliance between the post, the wartime alliance between the United States and the Soviet Union to last beyond the war. So if he believes that, yeah. why does he bail on Wallace at the convention where Wallace loses the vice presidency? Roosevelt, by that point in 1944, had become very sick. He clearly was weak. He, and the party bosses tried to convince him that Wallace was a, a detriment, that he could actually lose in 1944 in the election. And they kept on coming to him and saying that we have to get rid of Wallace. They understood that Roosevelt would likely not last another term. And whoever became vice president would be the next president of the United States. And these are very conservative people, the party bosses. These were the hacks who ran the administrations in Chicago and Jersey City and places like that, Alabama. Uh, so they wanted to get Wallace off the ticket. Uh, but, and Roosevelt says, I'm a, I support Henry Wallace. He's my ally. And Roosevelt's family was furious. Eleanor Roosevelt was a huge Wallace supporter. They were very disappointed that Franklin didn't fight harder for Wallace. July 20th, 1944 the day that the Democratic Party convention begins in, in Chicago, Gallup released a poll asking potential voters who they wanted on the ticket as vice president. 2% said they wanted Harry Truman. 65% said they wanted Henry Wallace. Wallace was the second most popular man in America, second only to Roosevelt. You've got to remember the, the period we're dealing with and what Wallace represented Well, that's that even more to the argument then, why doesn't Roosevelt fight for him? Because you know, the whole idea, in theory, of getting Wallace yes. is you defend your post-war vision. Yes. You bail on Wallace and hand it to Truman, you've got to know you're giving up your whole post-war vision to a hack. To a hack. To a hack. You know, we have a lot about Truman there, but it is literally, if you look up hack in the dictionary, you have a picture of Harry Truman there. Uh, when he was part of the Pendergast machine that ran Kansas City, and Pendergast was the one who got him, chose him in 1934 to run for the Senate. He was asked by reporters, why of all people did you choose Harry Truman to run for the Senate? And Pendergast says, I wanted to show the world that a well-oiled machine can take an office clerk and get him elected to the Senate. Uh, I mean, that, Truman was not, now he's a near great president in some people's eyes. 
Uh, Condoleezza Rice called and said, told Time Magazine that Truman was her man of the century for the 20th well, century. Well, there is something appropriate in that. Yes, there any, is. We do rate, that. Uh, yes, I, I totally. But, 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 do you get more of a sense of Roosevelt's position? Like, okay, the party bosses come and say, Wallace, we won't support Wallace. Roosevelt He'll did not have the strength. The party. Yeah, and Roosevelt did not have the strength to fight like he used to. And he said, I can't get myself reelected. It's in your hands, basically. Did Eleanor and write about this? Eleanor commented about it a lot. And in fact, after Franklin dies, Eleanor goes to Wallace and says, you're the only hope we have left. You've got to stand up against Truman. You've got to stand up against these conservative po policies. You're our one hope for the liberals' hope for the future. Which she is knew that, and as did the other members of the, Wall of the Roosevelt family. They were all publicly on record as Wallace supporters. They were all very disappointed that Franklin didn't fight more. And Franklin did issued a statement saying if I were a, 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 a delegate to the convention, I would vote for Henry Wallace. Uh, but there were a lot of other delegates to the convention who tried to do that. I mean, so Wallace has 65% support. And when the convention begins, Wallace makes a, nom a seconding speech for Roosevelt's nomination, and the place goes wild. And, and the demonstration is led by people like Hubert Humphrey and Adlai Stevenson, who were much more progressive at that period. And it goes on for almost an hour. And in the midst of that, Senator Claude Pepper from Florida realizes if he could get Wallace's name and nomination that night, then he'll defy the party bosses. Wallace will sweep the nomination, he'll get back on the ticket as vice president. And, and, and Pepper fights his way up to the microphone. Not knowing what to do, Jackson called the vote for adjournment. A few said aye, but the overwhelming majority boomed nay. And yet, Jackson had the gall to announce that the vote to adjourn had passed. It was outrageous. Confusion filled the hall. Pepper had reached the first step of the stage, only five feet, probably nine seconds from the microphone, before the bosses forced adjournment against the will of the delegates. If he could have nominated Wallace in those moments, there is no doubt Henry Wallace would have been overwhelmingly returned as vice president. What I understood Pepper wrote was that for better or worse, history was turned topsy-turvy that night in Chicago. Samuel Jackson apologized to Pepper the next day, and Pepper wrote in his autobiography that Jackson said, I had strict instructions from Hannigan not to let the convention nominate the vice president last night. Had Pepper gotten five more feet and got Wallace's name back in nomination, what we're arguing is not only would there have been no atomic bombing in 1945, there very possibly would have been no Cold War in 1945. Wallace was that much of a visionary and that much of a fighter against these kinds of policies. Well, this, this whole convention is extraordinarily well towed in the film. Please join us for the next segment of our interview with Peter Kuznick about untold history of the United States on The Real News Network.